our shared effort to care for our constituency and to work together to find a cause and a cure for scleroderma, we must also attend to the comfort of those living with scleroderma day to day. Not long ago, any talk about the role of cannabis in the care of chronically ill people was done so in hushed tones and the occasional frantic giggle. Not so anymore. Cannabis treatment is taking its place in our lexicon and here today to help us get more familiar with the role of cannabis in clinical trial is our longtime friend and remarkable physician, Dr. Robert Sims. <laughs> Dr. Sims is the rheumatology section chief at Boston University School of Medicine. His topic today is the role of cannabis and related substances in scleroderma clinical trial update. His major research interest is in scleroderma clinical outcome measures and clinical trials. He has over 38 years of experience and is a leader at the Boston University scleroderma program which has treated over 1,200 patients with scleroderma from around the world. Please join me in enthusiastically welcoming Dr. Sims. Thank you. Thanks, Jack, and good morning, and uh, thank you so much for uh, asking us to uh, spend some time with you this morning talking about uh, some of our research. Now, I know I'm going to disappoint some of you who are expecting me to hand out prescriptions for marijuana at the end of my talk. So I want to set the record straight. That's not exactly what we're going to do today. But what I'm going to try to do is give you some background information about some cutting edge research uh, on the cannabinoid system, which is an evolving area of understanding uh, in, a, in a complex biologic system which is involved in regulation of mood, uh, pain, uh, and especially important in autoimmune disease in the regulation of the immune response and inflammation. And I think we'll find that that's especially relevant for you all. So this is an evolving story. Um, this is not really about uh, necessarily medicinal use of marijuana. Uh, I'm certainly happy to answer questions about that, but I will not be giving you advice on whether you should take it orally or whether you should take a bath in it or how much you should use. Uh, so bear with me on that. Hopefully we won't disappoint and uh, I will be only a minimal obstruction to your getting lunch today. So um, without further ado, um, let's move on. Uh, here are my disclosures. I should importantly point out that this trial, uh, which we're going to talk to you about, uh, is published in preliminary form only. This is, this is, er, this is sort of cutting edge information about use of these medicines uh, in the setting of autoimmune disease in general and scleroderma in particular. So this is not established science. This is evolving science. So uh, with that caveat, um, I'm going to disclose uh, these other uh, industry sponsors that help us uh, do our, our research in the form of uh, grant support. So uh, let's put this in a little bit of historical context. You know, it's amazing that marijuana has been around medicinally for 4,000 years. Uh, okay, so the, the Egyptians in their hieroglyphics, and I can't prove this to you because, of course, I don't know anything about hieroglyphics, uh, but looking at early reports of Egyptian medicinal approaches, uh, it, it is uh, reasonably clear, reasonably established, I think, historically, uh, that marijuana was used medicinally by the Egyptians and later by the Greeks. Um, it wasn't until 1964, however, that uh, the principal chemical component of uh, marijuana uh, was discovered, actually two forms, uh, THC or tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, was isolated from one of the most commonly grown plants, cannabis sativa. Um, and so the, it turns out that THC, of course, is the main psychotropic ingredient of, uh, of cannabis. Cannabidiol uh, is a CBD, which is the non-psychogenic uh, uh, main uh, cannabis ingredient. Shortly after... Uh, uh, 1964, with a lot of intensive research into this uh, uh, substance, uh, the en endocannabinoid system, this biologic system which involves uh, these lipid-based neurotransmitters, uh, was discovered. Uh, and we've continued to have an evolution of information 
um, about this uh, intriguing endogenous system, again, that has a vari wide variety of physio physiologic and cognitive functions. So this is, again, called the endocannabinoid uh, system. Um, and it, it is basically comprised of lipid-based neurotransmitters, or ligands, that uh, connect to uh, cell surface uh, cannabinoid receptors. So it takes the ligand attaching to a receptor to then facilitate a biologic response within that cell. And these cannabinoid receptors are distributed throughout uh, the central nervous system and particularly relevant to us uh, today, the immune system and the immune response. So uh, the density of those receptors determines sort of the major physiologic response, and it varies across different species. Uh, so mice, for example, have very higher, much higher levels than humans of these cannabinoid receptors throughout their central nervous systems. And so that uh, probably influences in a major way kind of the physiologic response uh, to stimulation of these receptors either by endocannabinoids, those are the endogenous cannabinoid receptor ligands, or external cannabinoid receptor uh, stimulants, for example, uh, 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 marijuana, which is essentially a mimic of some of these uh, internal uh, 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 ligands. So uh, again, uh, the ECS, or endocannabinoid system, modulates a variety of physiologic and cognitive processes, pain, appetite, mood, and memory, for example. And it's interesting that um, the uh, euphoria, the so-called runner's high of, uh, of, uh, uh, of exercise physiology is probably mediated in large part by this endocannabinoid system, um, which, uh, which has these uh, physiologic and euphoric um, and cognitive effects. The principal endocannabinoid ligands, uh, these are the things that float around and stimulate the receptors, are known as uh, anadamide, or AEA, and uh, a substance called 2-AG, or 2 arachnoidal glycerol, arachnoidal glycerol, which is, uh, both of which are related to um, a lipid substance known as arachidonic acid. So in terms of the uh, immune system more specifically, uh, there are uh, these two, there are two principal receptors, CB1, uh, the CB1 receptor, the CB2 receptor. Um, and uh, the CB1 receptor is found primarily um, within the brain and the central nervous system. Um, and it is the main molecular target of the endocannabinoid known as AEA that I just mentioned. And it's also mimicked by THC. So when you, when you ingest marijuana, uh, the THC within marijuana stimulates um, CB1 receptors throughout the nervous system in much the same way that your own endogenous form of AEA does. So again, THC is, a, is a, a mimic of AEA. Now, by contrast, the type 2 receptor, the CB2 receptor, is expressed predominantly on immune cells, especially uh, activated immune cells known as TH17, TH17 cells, which are a type of T cell, which are integrally involved in uh, the mechanisms that we think uh, um, proliferate and sustain autoimmune diseases. So in vitro, so uh, in the test tube, um, CBD, which is the, uh, the non-psychotropic non-psychotropic ingredient of marijuana, including AEA and 2AG, stimulate CB1 receptors, CB2 receptors, and they reduce uh, what are known as pro-inflammatory cytokines. These are uh, cellular signals uh, which stimulate inflammation within the immune response. So the, wh what I'm saying is these substances, when they interact uh, with the, um, the receptors, CB1R and CB2R, reduce inflammation in the test tube. Uh, now those uh, inflammatory cytokines include ones that you might hear about ones called interferon gamma, but there are many others. TNF-alpha, that's the principal one in rheumatoid arthritis. 
that we know if we block really changes the course and the natural history of rheumatoid arthritis. So these are very important uh, cytokines which are overexpressed in many inflammatory and autoimmune diseases. So the in vitro evidence uh, emerged some time ago but suggests that uh, these uh, cannabinoids, both the endocannabinoids as well as externally administered ones like THC, um, uh, basically what's known as downregulate the inflammatory response. Um, in addition, uh, it's been known that in the test tube, CBD, the non-psychotropic ingredient of marijuana, also reduces B cell proliferation and production of uh, immunoglobulins or antibodies. So again, additional basic evidence from the test tube that these medicines reduce inflammation. Now what about the evidence in autoimmune disease? It's, you know, it's not terribly robust, so, but we're beginning to see uh, some interest in exploring these uh, agents within uh, the, the entire category of, uh, of autoimmune disease. Uh, it's been known in rheumatoid arthritis for several years now that there is overexpression of CB1 receptors, also CB2 receptors, which are found in synovial cells. Synovial cells in rheumatoid arthritis are the inner lining cells of the joint that proliferate like benign tumors in the case of rheumatoid arthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis is, is essentially a disease of synovial cells, and it turns out that these uh, receptors, uh, which uh, interact with um, the uh, cannabinoid ligands, uh, are found in increased amount. In addition, uh, these cannabinoids, including AEA and 2AG, are also found in high amounts in synovial fluid. Um, so now, why would it be that they're found in high amounts if they reduce inflammation? Well, the hypothesis is that they are, um, they are in higher amounts to counteract, if you will, as a, uh, a compensatory response to the intense inflammation which characterizes synovial proliferation in, uh, in rheumatoid arthritis. Now in multiple sclerosis there are, uh, there are some uh, clinical trials that have looked at um, uh, the cannabinoids. Uh, one in particular, probably the largest randomized controlled trial, donorabinol, donorabinol um, uh, and also uh, uh, THC but to a lesser degree showed decreased disability progression uh, in a subgroup of patients, but the overall result in, in the entire population, I think of around 400 people that were involved in this clinical trial, uh, uh, showed no direct benefit. So it was only in a subgroup. So there are conflicting results with, re with respect to the efficacy in MS, but we're looking at large clinical outcomes like extent of disability, not looking at sort of uh, the microscopic level uh, within the test tube. In inflammatory bowel disease, uh, very early data, very small trial showed that THC treatment seemed to reduce uh, a Crohn's disease activity index and improved quality of life. So the, you know, it's, it's pretty scant stuff, not a lot of uh, consensus yet uh, on the role of these agents. So I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about, more about scleroderma and uh, the immune uh, effects of cannabinoids uh, in scleroderma specifically, but before we get to that, maybe a quick primer on sort of the normal innate immune response. Um, so this is the inflammatory response that characterizes um, the time course of inflammation. So uh, when you have an infection or when you have um, the onset of inflammation uh, either in autoimmune disease or in, um, in the case of infection. Um, just trying to get my pointer to work here. Um, well, um, maybe not. Um, so what happens is um, you have uh, this innate immune response uh, with activation and then over time gradual resolution with clearance of bacteria, the inflammatory cells and debris. Uh, eventually you get wound healing and tissue repair. You get return of vascular cells to the basal state and it all goes away. Um, but we think of failure of resolution of the innate immune response as the process which leads to chronic inflammation and that in turn 
uh, leads to fibrosis and damage. Uh, really the situation that we think characterizes many illnesses, but particularly um, uh, scleroderma. Now this is, this is this probably, um, this slide, I, I sort of apologize for uh, this slide. It, it, it's, um, it's TMI, and, uh, 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 but, I, but I like these, these kind of, these pictures to try to um, help me explain um, complex ideas. So, um, I wish I had my pointer working. Oh, there it is. Maybe that works. Let me try to walk you through this really quick. So, um, oh, there we go. So over here, um, this little blue uh, schematic portion of the diagram over here uh, represents the uh, CB2 receptor, uh, and this is this is essentially a cartoon of a of a cell, and uh, that line across the top, the horizontal line, is the cell surface. This is the nucleus of the cell, and these are intracellular signaling molecules. So what happens? We think. Uh, when the ligand, either externally or endogenously, uh, AE2 or 2AG, stimulates that receptor on the cell surface, the CB2 receptor, that in turn invokes a cascade of molecular events uh, characterized by the production of NF-kappa B and the, I'm sorry, the reduction of NF-kappa B. Uh, NF-kappa B is a a, a centrally uh, controlling uh, transcription factor that leads to production of inflammation and ultimately fibrosis. So basically we think that the way these cannabinoids work is by interrupting this intracellular signal process that results in NF-kappa B decreasing and therefore um, uh, reducing uh, the process that triggers, the downstream process that triggers inflammation. It turns out that if you, uh, you can actually identify humans who have improperly functioning CB2 receptors, and it turns out that they develop excessive inflammation and fibrosis as well as autoimmunity spontaneously. For example, Individuals who have hypofunctioning CB2 receptors uh, develop uh, severe liver inflammation and fibrosis uh, when exposed to uh, relatively benign forms of hepatitis, for example, hepatitis A, which usually resolves without much sequelae, but in these individuals actually results in uh, hepatic fibrosis and chronic inflammation. And we also know now that individuals with abnormally functioning CB2 receptors, that is, that don't work normally, uh, are more susceptible to autoimmune diseases, including juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, a condition known as ITP or idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, and celiac disease. So we think this is consistent with basically a failure to resolve the innate immune response. Um, that is, hypofunctioning of CB2 receptors. Now, it turns out that you can take a mouse and you can breed it so that it doesn't have any CB2 receptors. Um, and when you expose that mouse to a stimulant known as hypochlorite, uh, it turns out that it develops excessive skin fibrosis and lung fibrosis. And interestingly, even antibodies to SCL70 or anti-DNA topoisomerase antibodies, which is one of the signature autoantibodies that characterizes scleroderma. So in a sense, uh, this is an animal model of scleroderma induced by eliminating these cannabinoid type 2 receptors uh, that are key in immune regulation. Um, and again, verging on, on too much information perhaps, um, these slides basically show uh, in the, in the uh, right-hand panel um, a mouse um, uh, who lacks the CB2 receptor. This is the knockout mouse um, uh, who was administered hypochlorite and develops uh, extreme pulmonary uh, and uh, skin fibrosis, uh, whereas uh, the control mouse who has um, intact CB2 receptors 
um, does not develop uh, nearly the same degree of um, fibrosis in response to hyperchlorite. So what about scleroderma? Um, I've spent the last 10 minutes uh, babbling about things that we might not consider terribly relevant. Uh, scleroderma, of course, is characterized in part by chronic activation of the innate immune response with fibrosis. And of course, we all know there's a massive unmet need uh, for non-immunosuppressive therapy to resolve inflammation and uh, fibrosis. So what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes uh, is a medication, a cannabinoid, uh, something that stimulates CB2 receptors known as lenabusum, uh, or by its um, other name, JB2, JBT101. Uh, uh, so, you know, drug companies, when they start developing drugs, usually come up with a number before they come up with a name. The name is now lenabusum. You might actually see it in reports as anabusum, um, but believe it or not, there's a world naming authority about drugs, and anabusum, which was the initial name, got thrown out. Nobody wanted JB. Uh, T101, so uh, it's now morphed into lenabusum. Uh, so this is an oral selective cannabinoid receptor uh, of the type 2 receptor. So it, it's called an agonist. That means when it interacts with uh, cannabinoid receptors, it only interacts or primarily interacts with the type 2 receptor. Uh, and that in turn, we think, activates the resolution phase of the innate immune response uh, and reduces inflammation and fibrosis as a result, but without immunosuppression. So in animal models, um, we know that this agent also um, is capable of reducing inflammation and uh, skin fibrosis. Uh, so this, this slide is, is really just sort of a cartoon uh, depiction of uh, of what, what we think this, uh, this, um, this drug does. Um, again, it, it really has no uh, uh, significant effect on immune suppression. Uh, this is what the molecule looks like for, um, for those interested in chemicals. Um, and this is some interesting data on uh, how lenabusum has a direct effect on uh, fibroblasts, those are the effector cells, we think, that are critically involved in fibrosis. Uh, fibroblasts make, ex make collagen and scar tissue, and we think um, are a key cell in, in as I, what I mean by effector cell, they are key cells involved in the, in the pathogenesis of the disease. These are the cells that are triggered by other immune cells that send signals to the fibroblasts that make them almost autonomous uh, in that they uh, go rogue and produce excessive quantities of collagen that produces skin thickening and fibrosis in many different places. So when you take them uh, and you put them in a test tube and you expose them to lenabusum in um, increasing uh, quantities across uh, the, uh, the bottom of this graph, so this is uh, lenabusum, um, and this is um, uh, TGF beta produced by these fibroblasts. So when you um, when you add TGF beta to fibroblasts, um, uh, I'm sorry. When you when you assay these cells for the production of fibroblasts, here are normal cells in the blue, uh, and with increasing concentrations of lenabusum, you see a decrease towards normal in the production of TGF beta by these fibroblasts. Uh, similarly, and perhaps more importantly, you can see a decrease in collagen production by scleroderma fibroblasts with increasing concentrations of uh, this cannabinoid, lenabusum. So based on all this preliminary evidence, both in the test tube um, uh, and in animal models, um, uh, we were involved in a clinical trial of lenabusum um, uh, uh, approximately beginning about two years ago now. Um, this was called uh, JBT101, SSC001. And this was a 16-week phase two study. And phase two studies are designed primarily to determine safety with efficacy as, as kind of a secondary outcome. 
um, but also the sort of the pharmacokinetics. And also to get a hint about the biologic rationale. The phase one study is, is basically the first human study. So uh, it, it seemed to be safe and effective in, uh, in normal controls. So the phase one study then proceeded to a phase two study, which was to determine its safety and efficacy in folks with scleroderma. They had to have at least three years disease duration um, or have a skin score over 16 uh, if they had three to five years disease duration. Um, the skin score had to increase by at least five points over the previous six months and they had to have an elevation of IL-6 or CRP. So some evidence of inflammation um, uh, before the study. Now, what's interesting is that, and I think very, um, uh, a very good part of the design of the study was that it allowed background immunosuppressive medicines. So this was an add-on to folks, for example, who could uh, continue their background cell sept. Um, so the primary uh, effectiveness outcome was a, uh, was a, uh, a weighted uh, combination algorithm called the CRIS score, which is heavily driven by uh, the skin score, the modified Rodman skin score that we all use uh, in research studies of skin and scleroderma. But it also includes a measure of lung function, the FVC percent predicted, um, a disability uh, questionnaire component, as well as a global assessment by the investigator, the physician, and the patient. And so secondary outcomes were uh, looking at the change from baseline in each of the subcomponents of the CRIS score, um, as well as other patient reported outcomes, including a, a skin outcome that we were uh, developing. Um, so, uh, again, uh, primarily a safety study, but with, uh, with the idea to try to develop uh, hints about efficacy. These were the folks involved in the trial, including us at the end. And this was basically um, uh, the design of the trial. Uh, again, this is a little bit too much information, but there were different cohorts that were um, uh, given the drug over time. There were basically two different doses. Uh, in the trial. So if you enrolled in the trial, you were randomly assigned to one of two doses or a placebo, and neither the physicians nor the patients knew which one they were getting. The total duration of the trial was, uh, was 16 weeks. These were the baseline characteristics of the folks who enrolled uh, in the anab... Uh, see, I didn't correct this slide. The lenabusum, not anabasum. Um, and the placebo arm. Uh, most were female. Um, mean age, you can see uh, uh, mid to late 40s, um, disease duration somewhere around three years. Most were on com concomitant immunomodulating med medicines. Uh, the baseline scores for uh, the Rodin skin score, mid 20-ish. Physis physician global scores um, on a scale of 0 to 10, you can see those, and I won't belabor you with those, and most people had pretty normal looking lung function. Um, what happened to people in the trial? Uh, probably again a little bit too much information here. Um, maybe a little hard to see just because of the graphic uh, colors, but 24 completed the study out of 43 randomized in, uh, in the, um, uh, the active treatment arm and uh, 14 in the uh, placebo arm. So in terms of uh, safety, uh, importantly, the summary statement over the 16-week course of this trial, there were no serious uh, or severe uh, events related to uh, lenabusum. Uh, and uh, just to translate, T-A-E-A -E stands for Treatment Emergent Adverse Effect. It's not to say there weren't adverse effects. There were actually quite a large number, and, and that's true uh, really in any clinical trial, especially in scleroderma, where there are, so an adverse event simply means uh, you had a symptom change, um, and, and then the investigator in the trial tries to attribute it to either the investigational drug or the disease. So there's, there's an attribution component, um, and so, um, so everything is recorded, and then it's measured, and then we look at both uh, those in the placebo arm as well as uh, the treatment arm, 
and you can see the distribution uh, in this um, graph of any treatment emergent adverse event comparing two doses, the five milligram dose of, of lenabusum, the 20 milligram dose, so four times the dose, um, uh, four times the dose twice a day, and then uh, the placebo arm um, uh, in, in the center of the slide. Uh, and you can see uh, the distribution over the course of the trial, the first uh, one to four weeks. Um, and basically, uh, not a huge difference, and certainly uh, not a significant difference between uh, the placebo and the lenabusum treated, treated patients really at any dose uh, during the course of the trial. So serious adverse events, really no different. Um, Looking at treatment emergent adverse events by organ system, uh, uh, comparing the uh, lenabusum uh, folks by organ system with the placebo, you can see those for yourself there. Um, certainly nothing jumps out um, except when you look at uh, nervous system. Uh, you can see perhaps an increase, 37% versus 26% in the placebo group with respect to nervous system uh, complaints, and that turned out to be uh, dizziness. So there was uh, certainly a higher uh, incidence of dizziness in the lenabusum-treated patients. Um, and in the category of general disorders, fatigue also occurred uh, more commonly in the lenabusum folks, 18% versus 6.7%. Um, uh, so not serious, but uh, certainly something that we're going to pay close attention to in the phase three trial, which we're just, to st we're, we're just about to start enrolling for. So fatigue, of course, is probably the most common symptom in the general population and certainly a, uh, a common feature of scleroderma. So it's not a clear signal that this is necessarily related to uh, lenabusum, but uh, certainly something we're going we're to pay a lot of attention to. Um, so uh, by strongest relation, so this is a slide of the treatment of uh, uh, emergent adverse events by strongest relationship and uh, maximum severity. Um, and I won't go through this in great detail uh, other than to say there really isn't a good correlation between uh, uh, the severity of the treatment adverse event and whether or not you are uh, in, the, uh, in the treated group versus the placebo group. Um, and looking at a little bit uh, finer detail on the uh, CRIS score, um, I think uh, these data might be interesting. Um, so um, uh, looking at the time course of uh, CRIS scores in that uh, graphic depiction over on the left-hand side, the time course of the CRIS score change in both the uh, uh, placebo group uh, and, um, and the treated group. And let me see if I can decipher this. Um, so this is the placebo group over here, and you can see the time course difference with the increase in CRIS score um, over time um, with uh, the uh, folks who received uh, lenabusum versus uh, the placebo group. Uh, so improving CRIS score versus uh, uh, really a flat CRIS score uh, uh, sequentially over time, uh, comparing the uh, placebo group. Um, and so higher CRIS score representing uh, improvement uh, compared to lower CRIS score representing either no change or, or lack of improvement. Um, when you look at the uh, right-hand graphic de depiction in a histogram format, uh, you can see the same thing uh, with a direct comparison with the placebo arm in blue and uh, the L increase in CRIS score in the, um, uh, uh, in the green representing the uh, uh, treated patients uh, receiving lenabusum. When you dig down a little bit more and look at only specifically the modified Rodin skin score, this was a secondary outcome. Uh, you can see a decrease in the skin score in blue 
uh, comparing the lenabucin patients to the uh, placebo patients in red. They both go down, but the uh, lenabucin patients appear to go down uh, more uh, than the placebo group. Um, and when you look at worsening a skin score by more than five points on the modified Rodden skin score scale as, as an outcome, um, you can see that uh, that occurred much more likely or much more commonly over the course of the trial in the, um, in the placebo arm in red uh, than in the lenabusum arm in, in blue. Thank you. Um, so in terms of uh, the patient assessment of skin symptoms, uh, similar results. Uh, again, these, were, uh, these, these folks, of course, were blinded uh, to whether or not they were receiving the drug. But patients scored uh, skin symptoms using a skin-specific questionnaire that's now been validated uh, in scleroderma uh, with a reduction in those skin symptoms occurring uh, more commonly in the lenabusum treated patients than in the placebo patients. And also um, a short uh, five dimension itch questionnaire, interestingly, um, in better in the uh, lenabusum patients compared to the um, placebo treated patients. We also looked, uh, and I'll, I'll go through this quickly, in terms of a disability questionnaire, uh, as well as a measure of lung function you know, and even in this 16-week trial, we could see significant differences between uh, these two uh, other outcomes favoring lenabasum or lenabusum um, uh, compared to the placebo arm. Looking at uh, physician-rated change from baseline uh, as well as patient-related change from baseline, uh, it turns out that uh, the physician-rated change from baseline uh, didn't look significantly different uh, comparing lenabusum uh, versus placebo. Uh, both groups decreased over time. Um, and uh, similarly, patient reported change from baseline both improved slightly, but they weren't only, I, I don't think that was actually statistically significant, the, the difference there in that particular outcome. So I'm going to uh, skip over this slide, which basically shows that there, was, there were no baseline characteristics that predicted um, the level of CRIS response, either in the placebo arm um, or the, um, the lenabusum-treated uh, patients. Now, this is work uh, that was done as part of the study by uh, Dr. Whitfield and his colleagues at Dartmouth, looking specifically at sort of the biologic rationale for this uh, for this trial, if we saw improvement in the lenabusum or anabasum treated patients, um, could, did this correlate with molecular measures of inflammatory response? Uh, and it turns out uh, that it did. And you can see uh, this is some of the data um, uh, from uh, skin biopsies showing that gene expression for pro-inflammatory genes, which I won't go into in detail, uh, seemed to decrease uh, in the lenabusum-treated patients compared to the placebo patients, each dot there representing a single patient. Uh, and the trend, uh, I think you can appreciate, goes down in the lenabusum-treated patients versus uh, sort of flat in the uh, placebo patients. Again, providing some biologic rationale uh, with additional detail provided in this slide showing uh, down regulation of inflammatory uh, and fibrotic associated genes in the lenabusum treated patients compared to uh, placebo. So this is uh, a little bit more uh, of that uh, sort of uh, drilling down data on gene expression. In this case, uh, genes that are associated with extracellular matrix deposition um, that's the sort of the goop that uh, uh, connects us but is increased in folks with scleroderma that includes collagen uh, and uh, in this case uh, two specific uh, extracellular matrix associated genes fibronectin and thrombospondin 1 uh, both of which were decreased uh, significantly more in the lenabusum treated patients compared to uh, placebo so again providing significant biologic rationale 
uh, as well as an early indication perhaps of clinical rationale for proceeding with further development of this uh, cannabinoid receptor. So it, I'm getting the, I'm getting the uh, hook here very soon. Um, so in summary uh, and, to br and to conclude, um, uh, this stuff looks safe. Uh, there's no serious uh, uh, treatment, adver at, treatment em emergent adverse effects. Uh, it seems to be very well tolerated. Uh, its efficacy is seen in the uh, ACR CRIS score as well as uh, several other uh, sub-analyses and uh, some preliminary biomarker data uh, certainly suggests that uh, it has an effect on inflammation and fibrosis. Uh, and supports uh, clinical development um, of this cannabinoid. Uh, so in terms of uh, what's, what's coming up, uh, we have a phase three trial we're about to start. Uh, and I think what we're going to see is a combination of immunosuppressive therapy in addition to uh, anti-inflammatory or anti-fibrotic therapy. So I think what, what will likely emerge uh, uh, and I'm going to predict this down the road over the next three to five years, uh, is going to be a combination of antifibrotic slash anti-inflammatory therapy with immunosuppressive therapy as, as, uh, as the next significant step in therapy. And we're, we're actually working on uh, a number of other combinations. One is nintendinib, which is a uh, an antifibrotic drug that's FDA approved for treatment of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in combination with Celsept. Um, uh, we're about to start a, a clinical trial known as SLS3, which is a follow-up, of course, of SLS2, which will be uh, Celsept plus perfenidone, another antifibrotic drug, um, versus Celsept alone. Uh, but we're also looking at other agents, including an oncostatin inhibitor, um, which appears to be antifibrotic, as well as, the, as, well as several other agents. So uh, this, is, this, is our, uh, this is our happy group on a cruise uh, in the harbor, uh, our annual sort of mini retreat, and I have lots of people to thank for the work we do. And... Um, a call out to uh, Anda Bujour, who's in the audience now, one of our researchers and new young faculty who's going to be uh, working closely with us. Uh, her major role will be in the laboratory, um, but uh, she's also uh, very interested in seeing folks with the illness as well. Uh, and of course, thanks to our uh, former faculty, uh, Bob Lafiatis, who's now at the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, Mike Whitfield in Dartmouth, who uh, we continue to collaborate with. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sims. That was just great. <laughs>